this week on the Back Table Podcast. But I want, I'll want i tell you, if you are starting a practice and you're, you're in hospital, one of the ways that, that may work, and I've done this on, on multiple occasions, especially when you're starting uh, before you can justify your volume and then get your own, is split it with someone. So yeah. um, the cath lab or you know vascular lab, um, and that's often a good start. The other thing is once um, some angio suites have it built in, and I think if you're getting a new angio suite, it, you should ask to have it part of it. Um, even if your volume can't justify it, then the argument is, well, you know, let's plan for future growth rather than build an angio suite for a few million dollars and then realize we missed a huge piece of equipment. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things IR. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, our app, or Spotify. This is Michael Barraza returning as your host. Today's episode is sponsored by RadPad. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, providing clinically proven radiation protection during CINE and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro-guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information or contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And let them know you heard it on the Back Table podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about IVIS, uh, and I'm honored to be joined by Drs. Michael Cumming and Mark Lesney. Gentlemen, uh, welcome and thank you for doing this. Um, so I, I figured we start with, you know, are either of you using RADPAD or anything else special for radiation protection? I am. I am. Um, yeah, I've probably been using it ever since residency and fellowship, and um, I think especially for things like TIPS creation and sort of high radiation procedures, it's, it's just that extra level of comfort that I like, and I do use the no-brainers. Why don't we go ahead and start by having both of you tell us where you are and what kind of practice environment you're in. Uh, start with you, Dr. Cumming. So I'm in, uh, in a limbo. I left my uh, freestanding uh, practice a little over a year ago, and I'm waiting out a non-compete. So I'm just doing locums for the last year, and we'll be reopening the new center early in 2019. What about you, Mark? Yeah, so I've been in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina for a little over five years as part of uh, Vascular Interventional Specialists of Charlotte Radiology. We are a large uh, non-university affiliated group, um, but actually there's no academic center in Charlotte, so we're sort of the de facto academic institution here. Um, I cover three hospitals. I'm only hospital-based at this point, except for some vein centers, but for any sort of procedures outside of that, um, and that's just superficial veins. Um, okay. So so I'm a hospital setting. Um and it's, uh, you know, obviously we'll have different cost considerations and which I'm sure we'll get into than a uh, office based lab. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, one of the things that uh, that gave us the idea for this topic was a Twitter discussion that the two of you were both involved with. Uh, it involved a tweet, Mark, that that you had posted, I think I want to say back in July. And um, basically what it said was it said, you know, iliac vein compression requiring stent, not so fast. Compression resolves with Valsalva with no impeded flow and venography. IVIS is a complementary tool, not an absolute. Uh, and, and there's a really good discussion that followed. Um, can you just tell me basically you know, what prompted that tweet and, and basically how you feel about this? You know, are we over-treating this? Are we over-diagnosing it? And, and how does IVIS play into that? Yeah, so going right to the money uh, question, huh? Um, <laughs> so... So, yeah, I think IVIS is a critical tool for treating um, venous and I'll argue other vascular pathologies. Um, but just like any other tool, it can be abused and overused and under and misunderstood. And I do think that um, the pendulum swung a little bit from where no one was really recognizing deep venous insufficiency um, and pelvic insufficiency and non-thrombotic iliac vein compression to now... Uh, there are some places that are a little bit more capricious and cavalier, and I think we need to um, make sure that we understand that the totality of our devices and our clinical exam and the presentation must come into it uh, must come into um, consideration, not just one tool. Okay, Completely agree, that. Mark. Well, I just, you had a very interesting response to that, and I think it was. Um, you know, very enlightening. It said, you know, to be contrarian, we don't know that measuring the area during Valsalva actually means that the vein is normal. Uh, and you said you use area measurements as a surrogate for physiologic function. 
I was hoping you could uh, kind of explain what you meant by that. Right. So, I mean, IBIS is a great tool for measuring uh, areas of vein, and this has kind of been become the surrogate for, um, you know, what is a physiologic significant lesion. And it now, you know, we, we started off at 50% narrowing as being significant. And I think those of us that have done a fair bit of this have decided that number, that threshold is probably too low and that 60 yeah. might be a better number. Um, but we really don't know. I mean, when you really take the time with IVIS and you watch how the vein changes during respiration um, and, you know, other physiologic challenges, it's, it's fascinating. But we really don't know what any of this means. What I really mean by that is, you know, what, what tool do we have that can say stenting this patient is going to relieve their leg symptoms? And we mm -hmm. don't have a good answer to that question. So, and I think we need to make sure we get into this at some point. Now is probably as good a time as any. Um, you know, looking at these in particular for for May Turner, you know, how are you stratifying these patients for treatment? I mean, I would imagine a lot of this actually comes, you know, before you got the patient on the table through you know, imaging clinic. Right. Well, for me, uh, my I, I, I CT everybody uh, and do a CT okay. venogram. And then, and we basically, you know, acquire it like a, a CT angio just later and using that mm -hmm. and building a 3D model with true center line reconstruction through the veins and then actually doing area measurements. It's really time consuming. And huh. historically, I've used a, a, th a third party to do all the, the uh, 3D work. But if you really take your time and you have a good CT venogram, you can really create very detailed anatomical images uh, and area measurements of the vein. You, you simply can't do it off axial uh, imaging. It's uh, our brains just can't process that information the way a 3D tool can. Okay. Um, the CT venogram that you get, um, I don't know if you have any of the information handy, the protocol you use, um, particularly in terms of, of the reformats. Um, can you tell us anything about that? So just using a, a third a third party and, and 3D software, you go down and, um, you know, pick your center line through the IVC and then down both iliac mm -hmm. uh, systems. And then from there, you can get true perpendicular area measurements to the vein. And you come from okay. the common femoral vein back up to the IVC. And, uh, you know, I found when you get good at the CT software, the 3D software, uh, you can have really a high degree of correlation between the IVIS and the CT. So this can help us sort of triage patient don't necessarily need to get on the table. Okay. What type of a delay do you do? Like how long before you, you start imaging? I think our techs actually were triggering off the common femoral vein before. Oh, okay. That makes uh, sense. Standing up. Yeah. Our protocol, and I will tell you, those centers that do this well, um, do it very well. I think for a lot of centers, it's a little bit of a struggle. Um, so we do a, a fixed delay, um, and we've wrestled with everything from 120 to 180 second delay. Um, I will tell you, some of our CT venograms are absolutely beautiful, and some of them look like non-contrast studies. And so I right. think it is a bit of an I think it's a bit of an art, um, and you just have to be committed to it and sort of have someone who's championing this to make sure it's done correctly and works with the CT text to make sure that uh, you refine your protocol for your patient population. Okay. Right. Mark's absolutely yeah. right. You're going to have somebody that's going to take ownership and champion the study and the time to read them. They're, you know, this is a real time consuming. You make it better by having a 3D tech do the models for okay. you. But, you know, if you're in a practice trying to churn RVUs, these are not good studies uh, to do. Are you able to see much in the way of you know, the collaterals that you'd see on, on like a real catheter venogram. I, I've struggled to see those like I can on like an MR venogram. I think it's hard to differentiate uh, collaterals, particularly if you're doing this in the situ situation of, uh, you know, pelvic congestion. It, the pictures really aren't as pretty as an MRV, I would agree. Okay. Um, well, to get back to kind of the, the basics, I guess, uh, Mike, what all are you using IVIS for, you know, either on the venous or arterial side? 
Um, I use IVIS pretty much routinely. So the majority okay. of my PAD cases, I'll use IVIS. Uh, obviously, any iliac vein compression, uh, pelvic venous congestion, those are great cases uh, for IVIS. Um, I, I hate not using IVIS. I, I think it gives us okay. great uh, delineation of the pathology, gives us very accurate measurements, and it saves on fluoro time. Okay. Mark, what about you? Yeah, so I use IVIS for all my um, venous interventions, especially chronic venous interventions. In the acute setting, yeah. if yeah. I don't plan to, um, if I'm lysing another day, if I'm not doing single session, then I usually defer IVIS until I'm, I'm done and ready to sort of finish up the job. Um, but I'll tell you, Mike made some really important points, and I want to make sure we don't gloss over them. He talks about okay. how we use IVIS and how we think about that in terms of, you know, we're looking for 50% narrowing in iliac veins, and we're looking for cross-sectional area. And all of these things are somewhat arbitrarily defined by our gut um, and our expertise for whatever that means. Even the, the, the there's a big trial, the video trial, which which showed that um, IVIS changes clinical management in um, a good percentage of patients. The problem is, and this is a point that Mike made that can't be understated, we never show that it changes clinical management for the better, right? So there's no study that shows, oh, when I use IVIS, the Velalta score decreases. Quality of life increases. All we know is that when I use IVIS, I angioplasty and stented, whereas before I wouldn't have. But, but we really don't know. So I think getting familiar with IVIS is important, but I think we have to know its limitations. Um, so you asked me where I use it. I use it as a complementary tool in almost all my chronic venous cases, but along with flow dynamics of, of venography. Out of curiosity, Mark, uh, are you using it for your central, your central venous cases as well? Yeah, it's a good question. So I would say, you know, the I have a very large uh, thoracic venous obstructive practice, right. um, and I will use it for um, areas of of questionable concern. So in other words, a patient comes with arm swelling and they've got nothing on venography. Um, I've used it for there to identify webs that are can be subtle. The other thing is there is a compressive mm -hmm. syndrome in the chest called left brachycephalic or anominate, which is the less preferred term, vein compression syndrome, and where it gets compressed between the sternum and the aorta, and IVIS can be helpful there. So I will use it. It's certainly not as routine as I do in the lower extremity and pelvis, um, but you can use it for problem solving in the thoracic veins as well. Yeah, Mark, I think it'd be interesting to talk a little more about IVIS and iliac veins and false positives and yeah. how to avoid them and... Uh, uh, you know, what your experience has been with them? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's a, a difficult topic. So I think the important thing for our, our listeners is to know, I suspect for Mike feels the same way, no one gets on our table um, for even an evaluation unless their clinical symptoms warrant it. In other words, right. just because we see reflux, just because we see something on CT scan, that is almost irrelevant. The only thing that matters is that a patient has a clinical presentation that may be compatible with non-thrombotic iliac vein compression syndrome. And so once they get on the table, um, you know, the IVIS, I think, is to confirm that. Now, in terms of false positives, um, I've seen false positives um, in patients with uh, fibroids, uh, and that can be specifically difficult because obviously a lot of women come in with pelvic pain, pelvic pressure, maybe some varicosities. But is it just compressing for their fibroids, in which case maybe fibroid embolization or um, or if they're, you know, uh, want to retain fertility, myomectomy or whatever it is, maybe better to alleviate the compression than confine them to a stent the rest of their life. Um, same thing with respiratory variation. I've seen some very dramatic examples where you have almost near complete obliteration of the vein and then the patient breathes deeply and it's wide open. So a fixed stenosis is really what I'm looking for. Agree, Mark. I, I have a hard time with the um, with that non-fixed lesion and really believing that that's hemodynamically significant. But I, I think that speaks a lot to, um, you know, your intent to treat and your desire to treat. And you can make IVUS look positive in just about any patient. Uh, sure. Have them take a big breath in and the vein disappears or, uh, you know, the other sort of technical limitation, I think, is as the vein is sort of draped around S1 and L5, 
you know, the catheter can be is, you know, is biased against one wall of the vein and you can't see through the bone and often you'll miss a lot of normal vein. And so you can draw your area measurements, you know, wherever you want and create a, a stenosis that really isn't there. Yeah, Mike, while we're on that topic, can I ask you, I know there's a lot of people who avoid uh, Amplat super stiff wires or wires at all for IVIS and they'll do a wireless IVIS just to uh, avoid deformation of the vein. What is your technique for for that? Right. And uh, that's actually a, a great point, Mark. And it's really interesting to play with it because you can watch your IVIS as you pull the wire in and out or go to this floppy segment of a super stiff wire and see the way the catheter biases things differently and changes your imaging and would change your measurements. So um, I think, you know, for me, I generally don't pull the wire, but if I feel like it, it just doesn't look right to me or the catheter is really biased against one wall, uh, I will try and switch wires, pull wires uh, uh, to do that. How about yourself? What, what's your approach to that? Yeah, to be honest, I've been I have not been doing that as much. But the more, you know, I sort of think about it and I talk to, to other people, I think what you're doing makes a lot of sense, because um, clearly you're changing the anatomy, especially with, you know, some increased stiff wire. The other thing that I think we all need to be cognizant of is, of is when we talk to patients in clinic, what do we ask? Worse at the end of the day or beginning of the day? Worse when you're on your feet or lying down? Well, on my feet all day. So how do we do these procedures? Well, we lie them down. We lie them prone sometimes for a CT scan or IVA. So we've already sort of taken away a lot of the physiologic um, uh, scenarios that that cause their symptoms. And so we, we just need to be aware that we're sort of artificially looking at these veins. But that said, um, we know that what we do helps um, if we do it appropriately. But I think we have to be aware of these wire, position, prone versus supine uh, considerations. Totally agree. We're not uh, in a physiologic state laying flat on that table. Uh, and, you know, I think this really, this some of this stuff comes into play when we're looking at those with more, you know, mild disease, sort of C3 type patients. And, you know, we, we could argue whether it's stented on thrombotic C3 patient, but some of them are pretty miserable. And, um, you know, they're active, they're athletes, and they have a lot of leg pain and, and discomfort, but on the table, laying flat is not not remotely close to you know sitting on a site a, a bike for a long distance ride or a, in a marathoner. So, right. Uh, right, and we don't know. You know, you could argue even in your instance where you know when they valsalva and the vein blows up, but that's not you know just because the stenosis goes away with the vein blowing up. Maybe those people are symptomatic. Uh, and, they, you know, they do have a functional stenosis that you can remove by having them Valsalva. But again, not a physio, not a physiologic state. I found it interesting. I mean, there's an ongoing discussion right now on SIR Connect. And, and somebody had brought up uh, seeing the diagnosis of right sided May Turner like that. I've never even heard of that. I mean, are, are you guys seeing patients for this at all? Yeah, I I actually have a beautiful example of a right sided Maytherner on uh, on no my website. Kidding. Yeah, just phenomenal case. I'll check out uh, the case. I really enjoy yeah. the cases on your site. Yeah, thank you. So this is this this scenario was a uh, guy actually hardcore cyclist uh, had a typical medial malleolar venous ulcer, and he had a lot of superficial venous disease in the leg. And uh, we did a CT venogram, and between the bifurcation of the right common iliac artery, um, his uh, iliac vein was passing right through that bifurcation, and he had almost no flow at rest on venography through that stenosis. And we actually treated his iliac vein before we did his superficial venous disease, and his ulcer basically healed without touching the superficial venous disease. No kidding. I've never seen it. That's, that's cool. I've seen patients who were referred because um, someone told them that it's impossible to have a compressive syndrome on the right. <laughs> well, clearly we know that's not true. Now, in terms of terminology, <laughs> some people refer to it as a, uh, as a May Thurner variant or a you know, right-sided non-thrombotic iliac vein, iliac vein compression. Um, but 
to be honest, whatever it is, you know, to be careful, I think we should just use the term either compressive etiology, in which case it doesn't matter what side, um, or chronic venous, a pelvic venous insufficiency. Because clearly we know, as Mike pointed out, there are patients who have disease on the right from a compressive lesion. I mean, someone with widespread lymphoma technically can have compression sure. of their right, but we're not going to call that May Thurner, right? So, you know, I think, I think the terminology is is fun to know, but at the end of the day, evaluate the patient. And just like Mike points out, we see this. You just got to be on the lookout for it. Okay. Um, to get back to kind of into the basics of this, um, Mike, how long have you been using IVIS and what's the, you know, the learning curve like for, you know, somebody who's using this, you know, as a new user? I've been using it probably uh, heavily since the late 2000s. So like 2008, mm -hmm. somewhat sometime around then. Uh, and again, really started off with uh, super or with, you know, venous disease, iliac venous disease. But um uh, and the more it's just become an increasingly part of my, you know, daily use. So rare for me in a PAD case, uh, to not use IVUS. Did either of you go to any kind of training course or just kind of pick it up on your own? I've, I've had to kind of just pick it up on my own. Yeah, I did do a course, um, on it. I think, you know, the learning curve, is I think there still is a learning curve uh, when you're looking at some of these lesions and trying to understand, particularly in the PAD world, um, you know, what all the, you know, understanding plaque morphology, what are the implications of the plaque morphology that you see? How is this going to impact your treatment approach? Um, you know, there's that learning curve, a little bit of learning curve with the console and you know, we haven't really dived in. We haven't talked about it at all, but, you know, we do have two different technologies on the market um, that are really quite different from one another. And uh, maybe we should have a little bit of discussion about that and, and that. Yeah, let, let's do that. Because, I mean, I, basically, I, I just have Volcano and that's what I know. Um, what are the two right. different types of technology? Um, so there's Boston size device and then the volcano device and the volcano device is a phased array transducer, whereas the Boston side device is a single transducer that is mechanically rotated. Um, and so really quite different and the imaging, um, I've done some work in a pig lab with, you know, trying both catheters side by side and, the imaging from the Boston Scientific uh, platform is uh, the the resolution is significantly better than the Volcano device, but the Boston wow. Scientific platform is uh, you know it's a little more labor intensive to set up, and the console design uh, I'm not a big fan of the console design. It, it's a little harder, actually, probably I'd say even a lot harder to use than the Volcano. Volcano's done a very nice job in that console. You know, the buttonology is very easy and uh, and using it is easy, whereas the Boston size definitely has a longer uh, learning curve. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of when I started using it, we actually did not use a lot of IVIS in my training. And uh, to Mike, to answer your question, when I first got out and my first job, was, which was at a large academic center, we had the Boston Scientific device. I think it was from 1822. Um, and <laughs> I'm pretty sure I used it once and realized that this is insane. It was the galaxy to show you how old it is. So clearly <laughs> the, um, the technology is much improved on both the, the Phillips and the Boston scientific platforms. Um, but my first experience was, I think probably with the galaxy from Boston Sci. um, since that time I've moved exclusively to the Phillips, um, uh, PV sort of catheters, um, so I don't have much experience with the new model Boston Scientific devices, but but yeah, there's idiosyncrasies with both. And the other thing is compatibility. So for arterial work, you know, you have the Pioneer, uh, which is a uh, an IVIS guided reentry device. Um, so there's certain things you if you select a, a device, um, obviously cost, um, like Mike mentioned, resolution, ease of use, and then also compatibility with other devices you may want in your lab um, should be a consideration. And then the system you're using, I mean, you guys are using 035 and 018. I, I, we only have 035 where I am. Yeah, so let's talk about that. That's really an important point. So 035 is clearly my workhorse for venous disease. Um, I will tell you the catheter says 8.5 French. Uh, that's not true. It goes through an 8 French sheath. 
um, which is, again, my workhorse for, for venous work. For the arterial side, um, I would advocate to avoid the 018. The 014 is actually, okay. the, I'm talking about PV. Um, the 014 catheter is actually the better catheter in my experience and you can change the field of view so even if you're you know not necessarily in something where something where you would routinely use an 018 system the 014 does fine and we've actually gotten rid of all our 018 catheters uh, in general i completely agree mark the 014 catheter is superior the 018 catheter um and i don't know if they fix this but our catheter failure rate was a fair bit higher on the 018 system and uh, Volcano acknowledged that there actually was a manufacturing difference between the catheters, and uh, the ON8 was more prone to to uh, breaking or failing during use. So uh, we we I just stay away from the ON8. Okay. Yeah, you know I'll admit I have not uh, used it in any PAD cases. Is it pretty easy to tell if you're interluminal or subintimal? It's phenomenal. Uh, for determining that, I actually I have a great. I, well, actually, maybe I tweeted the photo, but I had a, you know, you, again, we could argue whether or not this is important or not. But I had a, you know, just a typical SFA occlusion, uh, anti grade crossing, easy re entry into the distal SFA above knee pop and IVUS. And I was clearly extravascular or, well, subintimal for a large part of the recan. And uh, so I kind of stopped and thought about it. And I did a quick uh, ATA puncture retrograde and the wire just ran right up into the sheath. And then Ivis again, and I'm true lumen the whole way, uh, you know, and does that really affect the patency of the intervention? I think so. Uh, but we I don't, do too. again, you know, did it make any difference? I don't know, but certainly probably reduced, uh, you know, the amount of artery it needed to be treated and, I think I got away with no stent. So I would argue Ivis really played an important role there. Yeah, the other thing is we always talk about Ivis as an anatomic tool. Uh, I'll give you two scenarios where that's not necessarily true. The one is an arterial system. There's a chroma flow setting where you can actually see flow through the artery. And and Mike, to answer, uh, Michael Barraza, if you, to answer your question, you see very nicely a dissection plane and flow in the true lumen if you're subminimal. Or if you're true lumen, you obviously see um, no dissection plane. The other thing is if you have, um, slow flow, you can actually see just like on, uh, transcutaneous ultrasound, Rolo formation. So hyperechoic, um, blood flow that is, that's not clot, but it's clearly slow flow. And that mm -hmm. is, a, we need to appreciate Ivis can give you. Uh, and then what about in terms of sizing? I mean, is, do you find it to be pretty accurate? And okay. Yeah. In terms of sizing, I think Ivis is the only way to size a vessel. Um, I th that's probably one of the primary reasons I use it for PAD work is balloon selection and the because you truly can see all you know angiography. It, you know, I, I really think it's a terrible tool. It's you know very limited. Um, it, all it really is is you know as we know a luminogram. It has, you don't really see the extent of disease. You cannot truly see the walls of the artery. Uh, so IVIS is more accurate. And if you, if you play around with it, uh, uh, do, do a run, have your uh, tech do a, a measurement off, uh, off your angio and then go to IVIS and you will see how, uh, how often angio I think is wrong and, uh, yeah. and IVIS is better. Yeah, and to tell you how sort of important that point is, um, a lot of the below knee um, paclitaxel trials um, failed, right, in the past few years. And I think part of the reason was undersizing. If you look, you know, a lot of their sizes were in the, you know, two millimeter, you know, high two millimeters, low three millimeters. And most people who use IVIS for peripheral artery disease will tell you if you run it down a tibial, it's not that common you're getting a two and a half millimeter vessel. Uh, most of us are using at least three and a half millimeter, and in some cases, four. So, you know, I think sizing is so important that you're um, ruining trials by sizing incorrectly, in which case that yeah. probably translates to not getting good clinical results or as good clinical results as you could with, with appropriate sizing. Now, that said, um, I don't use IVIS every time um, for, for various reasons for peripheral artery disease, um, but clearly have been using it more and more over the past uh, couple of years. 
Yeah, Mark, that's a great point. Um, the, you know, we eyeball, t- you know, your our eyeballs are really terrible and we should not be using <laughs> eyeballs to uh, pick off or pick balloon sizes. Uh, and down in the tibia, you really, when you're getting down to these small balloons, there's a big difference between a two millimeter and a three millimeter balloon. It's in terms of the area of the balloon, it's an enormous difference. And so that half millimeter or one millimeter really matters. And, you know, it's not unusual to use a three, 3.5 millimeter balloon, particularly in the proximal uh, tibial arteries, you know, you know, and, and to see a TP trunk that's four millimeters or five millimeters, you do see them. And yet, you know, it would be, un, you know, I'd be wary about pulling a five millimeter balloon off uh, the shelf to balloon something without, you know, in a, in a tibial or a TP trunk without knowing it really could take a five millimeter balloon. And the yeah. guy has, gives you the confidence that you're not aggressively oversizing. No, I'm, I'm with you. And um, one last topic I wanted to bring up is um, whether or not you're using IVIS in pelvic congestion syndrome cases. And if, if so, you know, how are you using it there? Yeah, so for me, pelvic congestion syndrome, um, the only time I really evaluate IVIS is if I'm looking for concomitant non-thrombotic iliac right. vein compression, which, again, okay. is not uncommon in pelvic um, congestion or chronic pelvic pain or chronic venous insufficiency. Um not only that, but keep in mind the left renal vein, the gonadal vein, and the iliac vein, they're all a circuit. And so they all interplay with each other. And I will tell you, um, that's really important for management. So for me, embolizing a gonadal vein is almost always going to be my first line therapy before I put okay. an iliac in a young woman. And certainly, my goodness, I'll raise heaven and earth before I put a stent yeah. in a uh, Right. So renal vein stents, I think, are are really sort of a no go for me, ninety nine point nine percent of the time. But um, IVIS is important to to exclude the other etiologies and to prognosticate. So if I treat a patient with pelvic congestion and I embolize a gonadal vein, um, even if I don't stent them that setting, at least I have a sense of you know, at least we have an explanation if this doesn't. Mark, I I agree, and I mean we could spend probably an hour talking about pelvic congestion, and it's uh, just remarkable how much we've learned in the last decade about this disease. And, you know, really, uh, I, I tend to think of it as there's primary pelvic congestion, which is ovarian vein incompetence, and then there's secondary pelvic congestion, either related to uh, an iliac vein compression or a nutcracker phenomena or nutcracker syndrome. I have gone to the I, I pretty much will IVIS all of these patients, um, maybe not their, their renal vein, uh, but certainly their iliac vein. And then when it, you know, some people have shifted their treatment, if there is iliac vein compression, that that should be the primary treatment it, with, with stenting and relieving the compression. Yeah, but I have a hard time with that because, you know, then we've got the long-term problems of stent patency and that, that gives me a, a lot of concern, particularly in a, a younger patient, this population that we're treating so I would rather, you know, go ahead and coil off an ovarian vein, um, knowing that, you know, the, the long-term potential negative consequences of that are, are really very small. Yeah. And, you know, just lastly, I mean, I think you bring up another important point. Uh, it's these young patients, and a lot of these are young patients that we're seeing, and you know, that's something that I've struggled with, particularly in cases of, of thrombotic meat kerner, is uh, trying to find ways around, you know, putting a stent in a, a 25-year-old and how to manage it after. Do you guys have any pearls for that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, for thrombotic, it's a different ballgame. Um, because that right, patient, yeah, that patient certainly already declared themselves as being, um, having deleterious anatomy. That's going to be, you know, clinically symptomatic. Um, assuming their thrombus was significant. Um, in terms of management afterward, I, I do, I am somewhat aggressive, um, especially for thrombotic um, uh, stents, post thrombotic stents. I will do um, Lovenox for three months. Uh, excuse me, sorry, Lovenox for, a, I will use Lovenox for a month, um, assuming the patient and their insurance will tolerate it. And then I generally yeah. switch over to a DOAC. Um, the the question of antiplatelet agents on top of that, I've wrestled with back and forth. 
you know, sometimes I'll lean toward lean, you know, using aspirin, knowing that the data is low, but the risk is pretty right. low. Um, and it certainly depends depends on the extent. So if I have a patient that I need to stand all the way to the lesser trochanter, that patient is clearly getting anticoagulation right. with Lovenox and antiplatelet therapy. Right. Mike, do you agree? Um, yeah, for non-thrombotics, I, it's a real, I mean, asking someone to do a month of Lovenox is a, that's a, that's a big ask. It's a pretty miserable yeah. month. Um, I, I, I probably change my approach constantly on what the right answer is for these people. I've, you know, I had a period where I was doing no anticoagulation post non-thrombotic, uh, okay. occlusions. Um, and you know, you can take it as far as the guys at Michigan, which are extremely aggressive in their anticoagulation, um, with both, you know, dual antiplatelet and, uh, and Lovenox. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we need some more data to really understand what is best. I, I think in the, you know, in the non thrombotic scenario, it's easy to be really aggressive. It's the non thrombotics. It's a hard question to answer. Okay. This is a great discussion because there's so many ways to slice and dice, uh, the management of these patients for my approach say with patients, you know, with C, you know, four, four B C five or six disease is that's a combination of deep and superficial venous disease until proven otherwise. And so I treat all, I, I investigate all of those patients as if they have uh, a form of iliac vein compression in addition to looking at their superficial venous systems. Yeah, Mike, you're kind of looking at it like a uh, claudication versus CLI almost. You treat the, you know, C5, C6 disease differently. And I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. That's sort of bringing it back to the clinical picture of the patient. I am very skeptical of people throwing in dense disease with just lower extremity edema. But by the time you have ulceration, I'm sort of okay saying, okay, all hands on deck. And there's actually some good studies that show that the, the incidence of iliac vein compression in venous stasis ulcers is not negligible. Um, so I, I certainly think I agree with the approach of treating those patients differently than the, you know, less severe patients. Right. And, that, you know, there is uh, an older paper out there, but, you know, what are the relative contributions of uh, pelvic, or pelvic insuff- venous insufficiency or iliac vein compression and superficial venous disease to um, someone with a, a C5 uh, C4, C5, C6 disease. And if you had to pick one, which one would you fix if they both had significant iliac vein compression and great saphenous vein incompetence? And I probably, my thinking has evolved. I would probably treat the deep venous disease before I would treat the superficial venous disease. I think it's really important. For ulceration, I, yeah, we're all hands on deck. I will do both. So I will um, treat any underlying deep venous disease but at the same time also treat their superficial disease, including, and this is an important point, including sclerotherapy at the ulcer bed um, to get a lot of those sort of local refluxing veins. Mark, actually, it brings, I, I completely agree with you, but it brings, it brings up an interesting question. If you know somebody has a significant iliac vein compression, would you do their superficial venous disease first or would you do their deep venous disease first? Do you think there's a risk of a, lower extremity DVT by doing a, a superficial treatment without dealing with the outflow? It's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, to, you know, to be honest, you sort of think, well, their outflow is already sort of impaired because they're refluxing anyway. Um, and so I hate saying it, but the bottom line is the way we treat these patients is based on scheduling who can ever get in. So whether they can get into our vein center for superficial vein treatment first or in the hospital where we do our deep venous stent. Um, but we have Mm -hmm. no set algorithm as to deep has to be done first. Superficial has to be done first. Um, but I think you bring up a great point, Mike. I don't know if you have, what what do you do in terms of, do you have a set schedule? I've like, I sort of mentioned earlier, I've just gone to this. I, I, I feel the deep venous disease should be, treat it first and first. then do the uh, superficial venous disease afterwards. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it's right or not, but um, yeah, I've uh, it's kind of been a change in my approach. 
exactly. I'll tell you where we where we wrestle is um, exactly what I said, which is just scheduling. You know, I hate you know our our vein clinics are sort of backed up, um, and so I think most of the time we end up treating their deep venous disease anyway, not for any smart clinical reason, but just because of scheduling. <laughs> Um, but, right. but I think that approach makes sense to me. Yeah. You know, I think the other thing that may affect, depending on what market you're in, um, where, you know, in my area, the CMS still pays for venous disease, uh, venous ulceration, uh, without a three month waiting period. Um, okay. but I've been in other areas where, uh, the LDC, is no, they still need to do three months of uh, compression therapy before you can treat their superficial venous disease. And yet you can put them on the table tomorrow and take care of their iliac veins. So yeah. um, that, that it's, it's a really interesting problem. Yeah. And if you're in a market uh, that that's true, where you need to compress a patient for three months before treating their, their, their disease from an ulcer perspective, man, you should lobby the heck out of that. That is absolutely absurd. And, and recent studies have, have really shown that early treatment of superficial venous insufficiency in the setting of ulcers is clinically beneficial to, for patients. No question you should appeal and lobby as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, I, I think that covers pretty much everything that I had in front of me. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to discuss that I didn't hit on? Cost. I wouldn't mind mentioning something yeah, about cost, but I want—I'll tell you—if you are starting a practice and you're you're in hospital, one of the ways that that may work, and I've done this on on multiple occasions, especially when you're starting uh, before you can justify your volume and then get your own, is split it with someone. So yeah, um, the cath lab or you know vascular lab, um, and that's often a good start. The other thing is once. Um, some angio suites have it built in, and I think if you're getting a new angio suite, it, you should ask to have it part of it, um, even if your volume can't justify it. And, and the argument is, well, you know, let's plan for future growth rather than build an angio suite for a few million dollars and then realize we missed a huge piece of equipment. Yeah, it's such a necessary tool. Um, it should be part of any any new angio suite, and. You certainly can't. I mean, you're, I don't think there'll be a cardiology department that does not have IVIS. So if you are in the scenario where you're getting pushed back um, from administration or, or however, uh, how, wherever it comes from, uh, you could try and share with cards. Well, guys, I think that probably covers just about everything. This was an uh, incredibly insightful discussion, and I'm, I'm grateful to both of you. Uh, I'd also like to thank our um our sponsor, RadPad, uh, contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And as always, you can find all of our other um, podcast episodes on iTunes, our app, or Spotify. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Aaron.